All right, Robert Schiller, the Nobel Laureate, says U.S. equities are still the place to invest. So uh, let's see what old Bob Schiller says. Is my shirt upside, inside out? Yep, it is, inside out. That's the kind of professionalism you guys come to crave here at Heritage Wealth Planning YouTube channel. In fact, I had a guy, funny, from, uh, just real quick, uh, from Detroit, and I'm not going to say his name because uh, no reason to, but anyway, uh, he had given me a one-star rating on my Heritage Wealth Planning Google Reviews page, and uh, <laughs> he said it was unprofessional and no of no value. And uh, I was like, I, I never... <laughs> I never worked with this guy or anything like that. He just didn't like my politics. And the interesting thing is if you actually looked at his uh, other ratings, they're all up in the Detroit, Michigan area, and then just one for me in Alabama, in Atlanta. I was like, dude, so I told him, uh, Google, uh, and they, they deleted it. So uh, just Clown Central, man. Lib's got to lib. I'm like, just, dude, just you don't like my politics, just move on. It's that simple. But all right, so let's see what Schiller says here. This is Dateline uh, 222, 2021. Lots of twos in there. Ooh, something weird about that. Just saying 222, 22 next year. Ooh. Uh, there's old Bob Schiller. Uh, U.S. stocks have the highest CAPE ratio of any global equity market, but yet they're still the place to invest. So remember, CAPE ratio, my friends, is the cyclically adjusted price-to-earnings ratio. That's supposed to kind of, instead of having the P.E. ratios fluctuate like crazy, it's supposed to just kind of level it out. Actually, I, I'm, I'm keen on this idea. And the reason I say it is because if you looked what the P.E. ratios were in uh, what, March, they were way low. Well, the reason they were way low is because the earnings, the trailing 12-month earnings had yet to be, so the earnings had yet to be reported for the Q1 of 2020. So we're still using Q4 2019, or actually the whole trailing 12 months, the whole year of 2019 earnings. And, and the problem with that was is that we had these earnings that were historical and we had prices that were current. And so if you have historical earnings that were here and the prices fell like they did because of the you know what happened during the freaking stupid overreaction to COVID, it made PE ratios look very, very low. But if you had it, in terms of what the earnings were projected to be, they would still be high because the, the PE ratios, because the price fell, but so was it the projected earnings as well. So the cyclically adjusted is supposed to kind of offset all that crap. It's supposed to say, look, on any given quarter, we're not going to do it, but over the course of cyclically adjusts, we're going to adjust these so it can kind of levels out, which I, I, I'm keen on. But there's more to the story. Uh, Schiller is a professor at Yale Finance. We all know who Schiller is. Uh, the title of his talk was Finding Value in 2021. This is a risky time for investing in the stock market, but there's a good chance the market will get on the same path as it was before the pandemic. It's always a risky time to invest, man, for the short term, which I want to challenge with uh, one of his compatriots, uh, uh, Jeremy Siegel. He says stocks for the long run. The idea is stocks get less risky in the long run. And my contention has always been there is no long run in stocks. I mean, there is always um, you're always in the short run. I mean, every given day, the market could fall 20, 30 percent on any given year. And as such, you're always at risk for your reaction to what happens in that time frame. The long run never comes, man. It's like chasing the dragon. You never get the dragon. The long run is always forever. You're oblivious. You'll never you'll never arrive and as such. Yes, stocks are less risky in the long run once that long run arrives, but it never does. You're always chasing it and you'll never capture it because you're always dealing in today. You're always dealing in today. All that matters is what happens to you today. And the market could fall 20% in the next year. Yes, in the long run, they might be safer on paper, but in reality, it doesn't work like that. And uh, Schiller and uh, Siegel go back and forth in some debates. And I take Siegel's side sometimes and sometimes I take Schiller's. The last time I covered a talk by, uh, let's see, the last time I covered a talk by Schiller was in May of 2020 when he said that U.S. equities were not giving much of a sell signal. Since that time, the S&P has returned about 13%. The U.S. CAPE ratio is almost 36, which is the second highest ever. Uh, at the end of 1999, it was 44, but still a long way to go to set another record. And uh, we've been talking about a high CAPE ratio since, I mean, my goodness, 2010. I think it was a high CAPE ratio in 2007. And that made people start, was it the CAPE ratio or is it the real estate? I forgot. But it's been a high CAPE ratio since at least 2010. I know that for a fact. Uh, he has a new paper that discusses how CAPE valuation has been affected by the pandemic. 
Prices are higher because Fed policy has kept rates at record lows. Uh, rates were not this low during the Depression and were not as low as far out in the yield curve as they are now. The 10-year tips yield is below zero. Uh, he defined a new measure. See, I hate this new measure. That just bothers me. The excess CAPE yield is reciprocal of the CAPE minus long real-term interest rates. And I guarantee if we would have been using the excess, the excess real CAPE, the whole thing about the CAPE being overvalued, would, would no one would have been paying attention to that because it's just, if you look at it in relative terms to interest rates, it's just not true as overvalued. Yeah, this is the this is the problem with the CAPE ratio since day one. Oh my goodness, the CAPE ratio says hi. Yeah, but what's the comparative? Uh, 10-year treasuries are below one, two. Yeah. So as long as 10-year treasuries are below two, the CAPE ratio inherently is going to be high. That does not mean it's more aggressive or more risky or not. So you got to look at both. And I just, you know, so the CAPE ratio hasn't done anything in terms of being uh, proven that too high CAPE ratios uh, invalidate um, the stock. We just, we haven't had the, the drop off where all these negative Nellies say, oh, the CAPE ratio, oh my goodness. And as such, uh, what happens is because it hasn't gone to according to plan, Schiller is kind of recalculating it. And rightly so. I'd take a lot more credence or credence, credence? Yeah, a lot more credence in the CAPE ratio, the E part of the CAPE ratio when you're using it to evaluate that towards long-term, or I guess in this case, 10-year treasury bonds for sure. I think that's what he's using, 10-year, yeah, 10-year. All right, so the 10-year tips rate, uh, the yield 3.6% suggests the stock market will outperform bonds by that much over the next 10 years. We'll see. So anyway, that's pretty interesting. So basically the reciprocal of the CAPE uh, minus real-term long interest rates, which is the 10-year tips, uh, which gives us a 3.6%. I, but this is kind of chasing. This is where the economics is just, it's all, like, I'm not saying it's foolish. It's not. I enjoy it. But it's, it's, there's no science here. And people say, well, a noble laureate at Yale says, it doesn't matter. It's kind of like the CBO. The Congressional Budget Office says, it doesn't matter. These guys don't know anything else more than you and I do anyway. Uh, but that forecast is not a, as reliable as an R squared of approximately 0.3. Ugh, I don't even know what the, but <laughs> the fact that we're talking R squared. Uh, the post-pandemic economy. Once the, econ the, once the economy recovers, we may consume less, according to Schiller. Huh. Consumers will realize they don't need two cars and they'll spend more time at home. Hmm. What does that tell you? He's not sure how long that effect will last, though. As we learn more about our ability to work from home, we will see there is an unmeasured advantage to society, one that is not captured by GDP. For example, there is less of a need to move for job reasons. A transition which can be psychologically horrible for teens. Society benefits from increased job mobility, but that does not show up in our GDP. Indeed, he said the ability to connect virtually is making him happier. There's always a problem with GDP as a measure of success. I completely agree. I would even argue um, having less traffic on the road is less bodies being injured in accidents. Not just dying, but just injured. Less accidents, less bodies being hurt, more productivity. And more productivity is a good thing for sure. Uh, the epidemic was unusual in its in economic impact. During the Spanish flu of 1918, there was a short recession. In 1957, there was a polio pandemic that killed 115,000 people when the population of the U.S. was half what it is now. Uh, this is equivalent to approximately half the deaths, deaths in the U.S. on the coronavirus. Well, if those are coronaviruses are actually attributed correctly, which we all know is not crazy, not true. Uh, there was a short, mild recession, and good growth resumed after that pandemic. But there's a psychological difference now because we were encouraged to stay home. We were very upset, uh, and this was unprecedented. I'm not sure what it'll do to business and consumer confidence. We'll probably have a good recovery, says Schiller, abetted by vaccines, and we may be, get back to a normal life soon. we got to wait for Dr. Fauci to tell us. Just think of it. If you're Dr. Fauci, you love the attention. You love the glory. No one cared about Dr. Fauci. The coronavirus was the best thing that ever happened to that guy. Yeah, so does he want it to go away? No, he doesn't want to go back into the sunset. He loves it. He's not sure how long rates will last. Well, how long low rates will last. Rates are low because of the lack of investment opportunities. That is the narrative that drives expectations. Even the 10-year treasury was as low as 60 to 70 bips, although it's rising now. So yeah, about twice that now. We are delusional in a way because we of the reduced view of inflation. He hinted that the Fed might support higher rates. The narrative of an easy Fed may not be necessary. We may go back to normalcy, just like Warren Harding said after the Spanish flu. Low or negative real interest rates are also driving real estate and home prices increases too. That's the asset bubble right there. 
Uh, what sector? You talk about sectors. I don't care about sectors. Um, it don't matter because I buy the VTI. Uh, let's see. Schiller was asked, what, did he talk about uh, direct retail investing, investing? Okay, okay. All right, uh, Schiller was asked whether he feels the, fears the growth in the U.S. deficit. Fiscal stimulus has always been controversial, especially when it's borrowed. The Keynesian argument says you never have to pay it back because the stimulus drives growth. That view of the stimulus is a good thing. He thinks fiscal stimulus still works and may not need to be paid back because, again, you know, a lot of Republicans would say the same. Uh, our, our deficit relative to our GDP um, is still quite, uh, was it the growth? I forgot what it was. Off the deficit to GDP? Was it deficit to GDP? Or, I can't remember. But uh, interest rates are, yeah, the paint, that's what it was. The interest we serve, the amount of payment we serve on debt relative to GDP is very, very low. It's just very, very low. So that's one way to look at it. So, well, we're not paying that much money from an overall interest perspective, even though the debt is astronomical because the rates are so low. Uh, but the sudden increase in the deficit since the start of the pandemic raises the question of whether it'll be a day of reckoning. You can't create wealth out of nothing. Yep. There's a limit to how much the stimulus will produce goods and make debt go away. I'm still behind it at this point, and the Americans need help for humanitarian reasons. Uh, he also asked about the possibility of UBI, which he thinks is an old story that's coming back. The concept originates from Thomas Paine. Paine wrote about agrarian justice and the fact that a small number of rich people are the ones who own the land. And he called for a tax be on land to be distributed as income to all citizens. Americans have something akin to an UBI with an earned income tax credit, you know, which is a government subsidy for workers. I agree with that. With rising inequality, Schiller said there are more calls for a UBI uh, his concerns that inspires laziness. Yeah, I agree. One hundred percent. I think without. I don't think that's debatable, frankly. Uh, if there's a more severe recession, he said people blame advances in artificial intelligence as the cause for job losses. In the depression, there is a similar outcry. Is a technological unemployment. It's more than a narrative. It has logic. People with menial jobs are the most vulnerable. Yeah, you wait, my friends. You wait. Uh, let's see. Uh, all right, income inequality. I don't think most people have a. Uh, all that concerned about income inequality. I just don't. So I'm not that people are concerned about their own, uh, what they can put on the table and their own jobs. They're not concerned too much about Bill Gates and freaking, I mean, they are concerned about Bill Gates, but not the fact that he's got oodles and, uh, of wealth. Now they are concerned that Bill Gates' wealth is buying him access to things you and I can't have. And as such, that access is allowing him a voice more than yours or mine, which is dictating that we are mandating vaccines, mandating, uh, of course, Bill Gates could fly around the world, but you and I got to stay home. The whole thing's nuts. But anyway, um, that didn't really, I mean, he still is bullish on stocks. Uh, I, don't, I hate to even say still bullish because, you know, if you look at the Cape historically, he hasn't been bullish. So it's an interesting uh, move here. I'm not, I'm not sure what to make of that, but uh, there you go. So Schiller's bullish. Uh, that, might be, that might be a uh, pessimistic sign, actually. We'll see. I'll put a link in the show notes. Love to hear your thoughts. See ya.